on a brutally cold winter night in January of 2001, 31-year-old Anthony Ursioli Jr. left his family's home for the last time. Driving away in his gray Nissan Maxima, Tony was headed to a favorite pool hall to play a few games with a friend, or at least that's what he told his parents. When he failed to return home, they filed a missing persons report and the true breath of their nightmare loomed before them. Two days later, Tony's car was found abandoned at a local park. Curiously, this spot was in the opposite direction he had planned to travel that night. There were no signs of a struggle, and Tony's wallet was found inside with a small amount of cash. These are some of the only pieces of physical evidence ever recovered. While investigators found no evidence to support foul play, they also failed to find anything to confirm that Tony had left the area of his own volition. While his family grew frustrated with the lack of investigation by detectives, they dug in and worked the case themselves. What they uncovered led them to believe that their son's disappearance might be connected to someone at a diner where he had been working, the same someone who had paged him the very night he vanished. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 223, The Vanishing of Anthony Ursioli Jr., Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious 2001 disappearance of Anthony Ursioli Jr. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, episode breakdowns, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or by emailing me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. As a final note, this year, CrimeCon will be taking place in Orlando, Florida from September 22nd through the 24th. I'll be there representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row, and I hope to see you too. Visit crimecon.com and use promo code TRACE to save 10% on your pass. That's crimecon.com, promo code TRACE. 31-year-old Anthony Ursioli Jr. left his family's home to shoot a few games of pool. He never made it back, and more than 20 years later, the truth of what happened that night remains unknown. This is episode 223, The Vanishing of Anthony Ursioli Jr. Anthony Guy Ursioli Jr. was born on Tuesday, October 7, 1969, to parents Sandra and Anthony Sr. Anthony, or Tony as he was most frequently called, would be raised in New York, on the rural outskirts of the town of Poughkeepsie, located along the western border of Dutchess County in the Hudson River Valley. Tony was the Ursioli's first child and would be their only son, as Sandra would give birth to a daughter, Lisa, eight years later. The Ursiolis were a very close-knit family who genuinely loved spending time together, whether it was taking family trips, celebrating holidays, or just hanging around the house. When Lisa was born, Tony doted on his new little sister and loved the idea of being an older brother. According to an interview Lisa did with the Coffee and Cases podcast, she took on more of her father's traits while Tony took after their mother. She described him as light, happy, fun, and entertaining. He loved telling jokes, goofing around, and of course, dancing. One key trait that Tony developed early on was the ability to save his money. According to the family, he was never the type to spend money needlessly. In fact, he was described as extremely conservative with his finances, with his father noting that more than 20 years later, Tony was still in possession of the money he'd received for his first communion when he was just seven years old. By the time he was in high school, Tony had developed a strong work ethic and an independent streak. While in a lot of instances, teenagers testing the limits of their independence can put an undue strain on their relationship with their parents, this didn't happen in Tony's case. Not only did he develop a maturity beyond his years, his work ethic and drive to acquire and save money left him with little free time during which he could have gotten into trouble in the first place. 
Tony performed well academically and after graduating from high school went on to attend college. His father would later state that even while going to school, Tony had maintained his dedication to his jobs, holding down three at the time. As an adult, friends described him as a truly genuine and good guy, the type to give you the shirt off his back. According to his family, Tony didn't like to see anyone else in a difficult situation and would often go above and beyond to try and make things better for whoever it was, even if it was a total stranger. According to the family, Tony began a serious relationship with a woman around 1993, and this relationship would last for just over eight years. The woman, whose name has never been publicly released, lived in a neighboring state where she was employed in law enforcement. Reportedly, Tony had caught her being unfaithful and ended the relationship heartbroken. His family was concerned about how this might affect him, but when they took a vacation to Cancun, they noted that Tony seemed to be in good spirits. He was dancing, swimming, and just having the time of his life. Despite the end of such a long-term and important relationship, Tony was resilient and bounced back. For him, the world never stopped spinning, and there was always something to focus his time and energy into. A month later, in January of 2001, Tony was 31 years old and still living at home with his parents, something much more common today than it was 20 years ago. However, according to his parents, this wasn't a situation where he felt trapped or was looking to get away. He liked living at home, seeing his family and helping out when it was needed. Still, in that hardworking, money-saving mindset, he simply viewed living at home as a smart idea to help grow his finances for when he finally did set out on his own. Despite the living arrangement, Tony's parents understood that he was an adult and didn't try to direct his life. They left him to his own devices, acknowledged his independence, and were proud of the child they had raised. According to Sandra, she and Tony were extremely close. Having been 20 years old when she gave birth, Sandra spent a lot of time with her only son, and while they maintained a strong parent-child bond, their relationship could sometimes be closer to that of best friends. The only times Tony seemed to spend money without consideration for his bank account was when it came to his mother and sister. According to Anthony Sr., Tony was extremely generous with his family, and while he maintained his focus on saving, birthdays and holidays were a time where he splurged. Although Tony still lived at home, he kept his own schedule. Most of the time, at the end of the day, he'd come to the family home and sleep in his room. However, on those occasions when he wouldn't be home that night, his parents merely asked that he let them know. According to Sandra, they never asked specific questions about where he was going, who he would be with, or where he was staying. He would simply tell them that he wouldn't be home that night, and they'd tell him to go on and have a good time, and they'd see him when he got back. From what information is available, it doesn't appear as though Tony spent an exorbitant amount of time away from his own bedroom. While Tony always held down multiple jobs, his family would say that his favorite place to work was at a local restaurant, the Duchess Diner. The diner, located towards the southern end of the Galleria Mall, was frequently busy, and as a result of both his beguiling personality and undeniable charm, Tony made a very good salary from tips. Reportedly, while the owner of the diner loved Tony, and so did the vast majority of the customers, there was at least one person who wasn't on that same page. Tony started having some trouble at work as he was under the impression that the night manager had a problem with him. According to the family, whenever Tony worked with this manager, he was relegated to working in the kitchen, limiting his ability to get tips. Whether this was done out of a dislike for Tony or because the manager wanted the tips Tony normally would have gotten himself, no one can say for sure. This takes us to the night of Wednesday, January 24th. No one knew it at the time, but this would be the last night anyone in the family would ever see Tony. According to his parents, he was working a shift at the diner. Normally, he worked long hours and treated the diner almost like a second home. He was there for his shifts, often stayed late, and frequently dropped in even when he wasn't on the schedule. This night, however, was different. Tony arrived home at approximately 9.30 p.m., which caught his parents off guard. 
Anthony Sr. would later state that it was so unusual to see Tony home from work that early that both he and Sandra commented to him about it. Reportedly, Tony explained that the diner had been slow and he wasn't needed. At the time, his parents didn't think much of it, but after Tony's disappearance, they couldn't help but wonder what really happened at the diner that night. Being that he was home earlier than usual, Tony told his parents that he planned to relax and get to bed early. That seemed to be the plan until approximately an hour and a half later, sometime between 11 and 11.30, when Tony appeared dressed for a night out. He told his parents that he'd gotten paged and was going to head out to shoot some pool. At the time, Tony frequented a pool hall called Sharks, which was located in nearby Fishkill, New York approximately seven miles to the south of his home and the Duchess Diner. It was a cold evening, with temperatures lingering in the mid-twenties and freezing winds blowing in from the north. By the time he was leaving, Sandra had already gone to bed, so Tony told his father that he would be home in an hour or two and he'd see him in the morning. He walked out of the family home, climbed into his gray Nissan Maxima, and drove off into the night. It wouldn't be until the next morning that anyone realized something was seriously wrong. That morning, Anthony Sr. told Sandra about Tony going out the night before. When his mother went to check his room, she found his bed still made and no indication that he'd been home. This was very out of character for her son, who had always told his parents when he was going to be spending the night out. When she went to check for his car, she found it was not parked in its normal spot, and this sent a shiver of panic down her back. She immediately went to her husband, explaining that Tony hadn't come home, and she had a sick feeling that something was wrong. Their first thought was that he might have been called into work early, but after calling around, they quickly realized that no one knew where their son was. They spent much of that day making calls and looking around for Tony or his car, all to no avail. Finally, at 5.30 p.m. on Thursday, January 25th, his parents called the police to report him missing. According to them, almost from the get-go, they encountered issues with the investigators assigned to the case. For the most part, police told the family that while they would take the missing persons report and look for Tony, there was a good chance he had left of his own volition. For law enforcement, it was fairly cut and dry. He was a 31-year-old man who had the right to come and go as he pleased, and according to the family, investigators did not take his disappearance seriously at all. This was exceedingly frustrating as the family felt betrayed. They had done what they needed to, gone to law enforcement for help, and in return they felt as though they had been treated like their concerns were baseless and foolish. In the initial stages, detectives decided to begin by questioning everyone in Tony's life. They interviewed friends and family, paid visits to his various jobs, including the diner, and interviewed co-workers, bosses, and owners. Given that Tony had stated his plans to go to Sharks that night, investigators also stopped in to speak with employees and regulars, though reportedly no one could remember seeing Tony there the previous night. This is somewhat of an area of conflict, though, as in the Coffee and Cases interview with Lisa, she stated that the bartender originally claimed he did see Tony that night, but later recanted, saying he must have been mistaken. Whether this was an honest mistake or was, as the family believes, the bartender simply not wanting to get involved, again, no one can be certain. When these investigative avenues failed to yield any results, detectives next turned to Tony himself. Over the course of the next few days, they began digging into Tony's past, looking for anything which might give them a new direction to follow. What they found was more of the same. No one could think of anywhere Tony might be, nor anyone who would want to hurt him. Detective Michael O'Dell would later tell the Poughkeepsie Journal, quote, Everyone there said he never gave anyone problems. By all accounts, he was a hard worker, a responsible worker. It's a mystery, but somebody can unravel it. If he's dead, somebody killed him. If he ran, somebody helped him, end quote. While detectives have said that they looked everywhere and sent out radio calls giving descriptions of both Tony and his missing car, they hadn't been able to track down either. 
Feeling like perhaps the case wasn't being handled as seriously as they felt it should, Tony's family began searching for him themselves. They called everyone they could think of, produced and posted flyers, and got others involved in the search. This paid off in the early morning hours of Friday, January 26th. At approximately 12.45 a.m., Tony's uncle, Jerry Gratzinger, came upon the gray Nissan Maxima parked along Wilbur Boulevard in a parking lot adjacent to Spratt Park. Located approximately four and a half miles north from the Duchess Diner, the park is a small one, which is home to a baseball field, basketball court, a playground, and an area for walking dogs. What made this location so interesting was that it was in the opposite direction to which Tony claimed to be going the night he vanished. Fishkill, where the pool hall is located, is nearly 10 miles south from Spratt Park. No one had an explanation as to why Tony would have traveled in that direction, nor even if it was he who parked the car there. When investigators were notified about the discovery of the vehicle, they came out to the park to examine the scene. The car, which was locked, didn't appear to have been damaged in any way. Outside surrounding the car, police found no indications of a struggle nor any signs that something violent had taken place. Once they obtained entry to the vehicle itself, they noted the car was in good condition and there was nothing inside to suggest a crime had occurred. According to investigators, the only item of value found in the vehicle was Tony's wallet, located inside the center console, and it contained just $21 in cash. While this may seem strange, according to Sandra, it was not uncommon for Tony to put his wallet in that console. Now, what exactly was done with the car, we can't be certain. You'd like to assume that a forensics team was utilized to check for prints or any other pieces of potential trace evidence that might help illuminate the mysterious disappearance. However, there have never been any reports released or discussed about what, if anything additional, may have been found in, on, or around the car. We do know that investigators brought in canine units to search the area around the vehicle, but it doesn't appear Tony's scent was ever picked up and tracked, and if it was, it led to nowhere. As far as the family has been informed, there was nothing of evidentiary value located. Detective John Wagner, asked about the car, would later tell the Poughkeepsie Journal that it was, quote, locked, as if Tony Ursioli put it there and went with someone. But we don't know that, end quote. In hopes of perhaps picking up a trail, whether that be of Tony or someone else who may have been involved in his disappearance, Investigators subpoenaed his bank, credit card, and phone records. According to investigators, while this was a necessary step, it wasn't exactly a quick one. Detective Dan Lundgren explained, quote, Maybe the first three or four days, there's a lot of activity. If nothing happens, you go through this long subpoena process. After a day or so, you could be anywhere in the world. End quote. In regard to his financial records, it appears there was nothing which stood out to police. However, there was one important question that records might help answer. Who paged Tony that night and convinced him to leave his house? Certainly, it could have been a friend who wanted to shoot pool. But if that had been the case, why hadn't this person come forward by now? According to all officially released statements by investigators, they were either unable to track down the origin of the page or they did manage to track the person down, but found nothing to connect them with Tony's disappearance. His family, however, disagrees. According to them, they know exactly who paged Tony that night, and it was not a friend. Again, no names have ever been released, and so all I can really tell you is that the page came from someone Tony worked with at the diner, someone described as a co-worker and not a friend. What exactly investigators were told by this person has never been shared, and why they felt this lead was a dead end remains unknown. What becomes really curious is that, according to Lisa, this person that paged Tony called the house the day after he went missing, something she says this person had never done before. Reportedly, the caller asked whether or not Tony had picked up the Super Bowl tickets. That year, Super Bowl 35 took place in Tampa, Florida, between the Baltimore Ravens and the New York Giants. This question caught the family off guard because, according to them, 
Not only did they not have the kind of money to have ever purchased Super Bowl tickets, but in addition to that, Tony didn't even watch football. Over the years, many have wondered if this call was really checking in to find out whether or not Tony had made it home alive. It becomes even more suspicious when you consider, at the time of this call, Tony hadn't yet been reported missing. In a bizarre twist, this caller wasn't the only person to mention the Super Bowl. According to the family, investigators brought this up as a possible reason for Tony's disappearance. By their logic, Tony made the decision to go to the Super Bowl and of course parked his car along a road near the park because that's what everyone does when they leave town. Park your car in a random spot, leave your wallet inside, and then fly down to Florida to watch a sport you don't even like. I can't understand why the family found this concept so utterly ridiculous. Many wonder if this idea of the Super Bowl came up randomly or if it's in some way connected to the person who paged Tony that night. Might they have suggested to police or outright claim that this was where Tony had gone? For the record, the Super Bowl was held on Sunday, January 28th, four days after Tony went missing. This was the same day police asked for assistance from the public, sending photos of him and his description to be published in local newspapers. It seems maybe they weren't so sure about the Super Bowl after all. Tony's family resisted anyone who ever suggested their son may have left of his own volition, be it for the Super Bowl or any other reason. Given Tony's nature and his love for his family, they found it hard to believe he would have just left days before both of his parents' birthdays and just a few weeks before a planned family vacation to Las Vegas. Anthony Sr. stated, quote, My son would not do this unless he had no other choice. End quote. Unfortunately, the month of January would come to an end with no new information, sightings, or solid leads to pursue. On Thursday, February 8th, two weeks after Tony was reported missing, his family announced that they would be providing a reward of $10,000 for information leading to Tony's whereabouts. His uncle, Jerry, spoke with the journal about the search for his nephew and its impact on the family, explaining, quote, the family is still holding out hope. It's been very hard. It's not like Anthony to leave without telling anybody where he's going. End quote. Over the course of the next six months, there was little, if any, movement on the case. Investigators reported hitting dead ends, and while they continued to pursue any information they received, a burst of phone calls that had occurred in the first few weeks had declined to a mere trickle, with one or two calls coming in every month to six weeks. As usual, the tips were followed, but they never led to anything substantial. There were people who believed they had seen Tony, working as a cab driver in White Plains, 60 miles south of Poughkeepsie, working at a fish cannery in Alaska. According to investigators, these were all researched, investigated, and written off as cases of mistaken identity. In August, the family became more vocal about their grief with searching for Tony and their anger about the way the investigation was handled. Anthony Sr. explained, quote, I'm in denial. The nights are rough. I would sooner not be born than go through what I'm going through. End quote. Frustrated, Anthony Sr. expressed his belief that had his son been a daughter, police might have taken the case a little more seriously. He began to believe that missing adult men receive far less attention from the media and interest from police who were quick to just say they must have gone off on their own. Jerry Nance, a case manager for specialized cases for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Virginia, was asked about the approach to missing adults and mostly agreed with the Ursioli family that missing adults, specifically males, do tend to receive less attention from both the media and police. He explained, quote, There is no standard legislation when an adult becomes missing. That's the big difference because it's left up to every police department. Some departments will take a missing person report based on a family member. There's got to be some reason to believe that they met with foul play. They may not even enter them, which is the way it used to be with missing children. End quote. Detective John Wagner was asked about the family's frustrations, to which he replied, quote, We have not given them their son. 
There's nothing short of giving them their son that the department can do that would satisfy the family. We are not any closer to knowing where Tony Ursioli is today than we were on January 24th. End quote. John Brooks, a senior investigator with the New York State Police, told reporters that the circumstances themselves dictate how detectives approach the case, noting that while they could use a large volume of resources early on, in the case of a missing adult with no sign of foul play, they're unlikely to utilize all of those options, saying, quote, we're not going to send the world right away, end quote. At this time in 2001, New York State had a total list of 13,047 missing persons reports. 7,017 were adults, of which 6,984 cases had been closed. However, in Dutchess County, Tony was one of only 17 adults reported missing who had not yet been located. In hopes of aiding investigators, the FBI made the choice to list Tony's disappearance as missing endangered rather than just missing. This allowed both fingerprints and dental records to be made available to local law enforcement, which at the time would not have been the case without the endangered listing. Unfortunately, the lack of any solid evidence one way or the other put investigators in a position where they couldn't confirm, at least with solid proof, whether Tony had been the victim of a crime. John Wagner noted, quote, there is no evidence of foul play. Nothing. End quote. By this point in time, the family had already begrudgingly accepted that the real footwork of this investigation would have to be done by them. In hopes of finding something, they organized a search of the woods surrounding Spratt Park. Unfortunately, it was a fruitless effort. In desperation, they turned to psychics, but found their information was always the same, accurate enough to get your attention and vague enough that it could mean anything. For the most part, these so-called psychics said exactly what you might expect, that Tony was dead and in a cold, dark, and wet place. Several of them agreed that Tony had been deposited into the Hudson River, approximately one and a half miles west from the park. Regardless, these statements did little to assist either the family or investigators, but when you're feeling that hopeless, any information seems like a lifeline. Outside of psychics, the family spent a great deal of money employing private investigators who were charging, on average, $1,500 a week. While this was a very costly venture, it was necessary as far as Tony's parents were concerned. Anthony Sr. explained, quote, Right now, my mission is to find my son alive and well. I think someone he trusted entrapped him with some kind of a scheme. End quote. According to the family, while the private investigators never managed to uncover much more than law enforcement had, there was one curious incident which sticks in their minds. The private investigator reached out to the person who had sent the page to Tony the night he disappeared. This person agreed to be interviewed, but during the discussion, the investigator found that this person was wearing a wire, recording the conversation while some unknown person was listening in. For the family, it seemed clear. You wouldn't go through the trouble of wearing a wire if you didn't have something to hide or some reason to want a full record of that discussion. To this day, they believe all likely roads to Tony's whereabouts go towards that diner. January 24th, 2002 marked a full year since Tony had vanished and it appeared no one was any closer to finding out what might have happened to him nor who had been directly involved. This was a somber and bitter anniversary for the family who felt continually frustrated with the lack of developments and overwhelmed by all of the answerless questions that haunted them. For Anthony Sr., it was like living a nightmare. He explained, quote, It's never, 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 never over. I wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, saying, Is this a dream? I'm about ready to make a career of finding out what happened. End quote. In hopes of gaining more attention on the case, Tony's parents agreed to appear on the Montel Williams show where alleged psychic Sylvia Brown explained that their son had been killed and dumped in the Hudson River. Reportedly, she provided information to investigators, including the names of people believed to be involved. As you might suspect, 
These leads, of course, led nowhere. And while the Ursiolis thanked Brown for her assistance, they didn't put much stock into her claims. Eight months later, in October, Anthony Sr. appeared as a guest on The John Walsh Show. Walsh, known around the world for the tragic abduction and murder of his son, Adam, had previously been the host of America's Most Wanted, and after that show's cancellation, utilized his own platform to try and boost awareness of other missing persons' cases. During his appearance on the show, Sr. announced that the family would be increasing the reward for information from $10,000 to $50,000. This resulted in a flurry of calls to police, an avalanche of new tips. But unfortunately, they didn't lead to anything solid or could quickly be ruled out due to misinformation or misidentification. It was, in a sense, back to the drawing board. Two months later, in December, the family was interviewed by the journal as the horror of the two-year anniversary approached. Their grief and pain was on full terrifying display as they shared how much the search for Tony had taken out of their lives. Sandra expressed her sadness, armored in a thin veil of hope, as she explained, quote, we're praying to God that he comes up the driveway. I just feel in my heart it was violence. He would have called, end quote. As for Senior, he put all of his energy and emotions into greater efforts to try and track down his son. He stated, quote, it's coming up on two years and it doesn't get any better for me. And I intend to leave no stone unturned. I will exhaust anything and everything, end quote. During this interview, the Ursiolis explained that Tony's room had been left untouched since his disappearance, and when asked if any new information had been given to them by police, Sandra replied, nothing, 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 nothing. Asked about the status of the case, Detective Wagner reiterated what investigators had been saying for nearly two years. They really didn't have enough evidence to say one way or the other. Wagner told the journal, quote, the hardest part about this case is that there's no evidence that something bad happened to him. There's no evidence that something good happened to him. There's as much indication that he took off as there is that something bad happened to him. End quote. The year of 2003 passed with no developments. So, in January of 2004, three years after Tony vanished, his family organized a candlelight vigil which took place in Spratt Park where Tony's car had previously been found. Approximately 60 people were present, showing their support for a family that desperately needed to believe someone outside of their own circle cared about their son. Anthony Sr. spoke with the media about the private investigators and psychics and again expressed his frustration with the failure of law enforcement to break the case open. At this time, it was announced that the reward for information would be increased again, now moving from $50,000 to $100,000. Anthony Sr. explained that reasoning, telling the journal, quote, we're hoping the reward money and the publicity will convince someone to come forward. Someone knows what happened to Tony. This wasn't an alien abduction, end quote. For his part, Detective Michael O'Dell explained that while he understood the family's perspective, they simply didn't have anything to work with saying, quote, I sympathize with the family. It would tear me up if it were my son. There's no concrete evidence either way. You can make a case that he's dead, and you can also make a case that he decided to run from something, end quote. At that time, it was stated that investigators had tracked down approximately 225 leads in the previous three years, though, according to the family, if that is the case, they weren't told about the vast majority of those leads. By this point in time, the Ursiolis had spent more than $50,000 in their search for Tony, much of which was spent on private investigators and 10 different psychics. Nine months later, in October, the family was interviewed for an article which was published in Glamour magazine. This interview focused in primarily on how little media attention the case had received. Tony's sister, Lisa, discussed the slow slog of trying to get the media to care, saying, quote, There are so many people hurting since my brother went missing. I think we'd know more now if the media had taken an interest, but they didn't seem to care. We have no closure, just an empty seat at the dinner table, end quote. Soon, 
time seemed to begin passing more rapidly. Days turned to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years. Around the date of Tony's disappearance, a candlelight vigil was held every year. Sometimes a large group would turn out. Under times, the numbers would dwindle. The family continued doing everything they could to keep his name in the spotlight, but without new details, new leads, or some sensationalized angle to it, the media simply wasn't interested in writing the same story and conducting the same interviews. At different vigils, the family asked people to write to television shows, news stations, and even people like Oprah Winfrey to try and get someone, anyone, to show interest in the case. According to Anthony Sr., he had spent a large amount of his time reaching out to the same groups and individuals. He stated, quote, I write to them and they don't even get back to me. They only go after the sensationalism. It's a sad commentary on how lackadaisical the whole system is. It will never, never, never go away from me. Time does not heal. People say I'm bitter and damn straight I'm bitter. If it was your kid missing, what would you do? End quote. January of 2011 marked 10 years since Tony had last been seen. At that year's candlelight vigil, Anthony Sr. implored attendees to get more involved and to apply pressure to the local community and law enforcement. He asked them to write to the District Attorney of Dutchess County, to the Attorney General of the state, and to local politicians and congressmen. It was, at the time, their belief that if the push for a more thorough investigation was to be made, it would need to come from a position of higher authority rather than the grieving family who felt ignored as it was. By this time, the same information that had been out there a decade earlier was still all the family really knew about the case. One of the few details investigators seemed certain of when talking to the family was that they could find no evidence linking Tony's disappearance to any bad or illegal behavior on his part. For a long time, there had been a rumor that maybe Tony had been killed in a drug deal gone bad. But Sandra later stated that police directly told her drugs were not involved in this case, saying their own investigation had shown Tony was a good guy, not someone who was tangled in things that would have put his life in danger. Asked his thoughts about the disappearance and the investigation, Anthony Sr. told the journal, quote, It's been 10 years, not 10 days, not 10 weeks, not 10 months. Time does not erase the pain. I believe he's still alive. That's how I get by. My wife feels it's foul play, and so does my daughter. But I can't get by without believing. End quote. In regard to some of the investigators themselves and private investigators that had been hired by the family, Anthony Sr. didn't hold back, saying, quote, They cashed their checks and left. Some of them retired. They didn't find much. End quote. At this point, the case was still listed as active and under investigation by the town of Poughkeepsie Police Department. Rocco Cordato was assigned as the new lead investigator by Captain Paul Lacombe, who said Tony's disappearance could be the result of several different scenarios, though he would not go into further detail on what those scenarios might be. He told the journal, quote, You have to go where the evidence leads. It's very frustrating that we haven't come to a conclusion yet. We respect the fact that the community keeps this case alive, and hopefully we will get additional tips. End quote. Unfortunately, again, the case started growing cold. Finally, we arrive in 2023, marking 22 years since Tony disappeared, and yet the investigation appears to remain in the same state it was inside of those first few months. Few leads, few tips, and almost nothing to run down. Kent Linderholm, a lieutenant with the Poughkeepsie Police, expressed his own astonishment that the offer of $100,000 didn't turn up any new information, saying, quote, we're a small community. You'd think someone would respond, end quote. Yet, all these years later, Tony remains missing, and no one has ever been charged with a crime or even named as a suspect or person of interest. It appears, after more than two decades, the case has become frozen, though whether it's due to a lack of solid leads or a lack of diligence on the part of law enforcement remains a hot-button issue. When last seen, Anthony Guy Ursioli Jr. was described as being a white male with dark brown hair and hazel eyes, 
standing 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighing approximately 140 pounds. At the time of his disappearance, Tony's jaw area was discolored and blistered, and he had a gunshot wound scar on his lower leg from when he was robbed when he was in high school. Tony left his family's home at approximately 11.30 p.m. on the evening of Wednesday, January 24th, 2001. He was wearing a puffy black down jacket and baggy jeans. Tony was 31 years old in 2001, and if alive today, he would be turning 54 this October. For 22 years, the Ursioli family has struggled with the aching desperation of finding out what became of their beloved son, brother, nephew, and cousin. Despite some information which the family believes points towards foul play, investigators have stated time and time again that they have never found anything to prove a crime had taken place, nor had they found anything to prove Tony left by his own choice. It's a case that lingers in that difficult limbo of the unknown, and for his parents, it is a devastating blow for which there is no comfort. Asked about his son, all these years later, Anthony Sr. replied, quote, He was always caring for others. He was just a warm and kind person. Everyone you talked to said he was kind. He was hardworking. He worked three jobs. He would do whatever he could for someone else. Nothing in this world brings me to my knees and humbles me quite like this. I will remember him until the day I die. Greetings from the Bluegrass State. That's Kentucky, if y'all didn't know. We want to tell you about the hottest new podcast on the block, Coffee and Cases. If you fancy yourself an at-home detective, if you find yourself yelling at the TV during that new true crime documentary, then you, my friend, are a certified sleuth hound. Just like us. On Coffee and Cases podcast, you'll hear about the missing, the murdered, and the unsolved. But the cases you've rarely if ever, heard about. All from the perspective of two teacher friends, rule followers, and self-proclaimed scaredy cats. Join me, Allison, and me, Maggie, each week as we take on cases that are often overlooked but are screaming for justice. Finally, a true crime podcast where you don't have to monitor the foul language. Coffee and Cases is a true crime guilty pleasure that you don't actually have to feel guilty about. Check out Coffee and Cases every Thursday for a new episode on your favorite podcasting app. The disappearance of Tony Ursioli is an extremely frustrating and perplexing case. As an outsider looking in, I can't imagine what it must be like for the family to be faced with a constant flood of non-answers for more than two decades. They lost their beloved son, their brother, and nothing they have managed to do has changed an investigation they consider to be flawed and conducted, at least in the early days, by detectives who were either dismissive, disinterested, or both. In the years that have passed, tensions between the family and law enforcement have grown to a point where investigators now communicate through Tony's sister, Lisa, saying that his father is too intense and difficult to deal with. Imagine how insulting and repugnant it must be to be told by the people you're supposed to be able to trust that you're too difficult to deal with because you're desperately missing your one and only son. Frankly, given what I've seen of this investigation, how the hell would anyone not become a little difficult to deal with when you feel like no one cares and no one's really doing anything? This is the type of case I know before I even start researching it's going to be exceedingly disconcerting because of the lack of available evidence and information. A 31-year-old guy, known throughout the area by many people and considered to be a genuinely good man, goes missing and no one knows anything. His car's found abandoned in a park and nobody saw anything. A reward of $100,000 is offered and no one calls him with anything reliable? I don't know about you, but for me... $100,000 would be an absolutely life-changing amount of money, and I can't think of a single situation I could possess knowledge of that I wouldn't come forward with for that reward. Unless, of course, I was directly involved in the crime. Perhaps that's the case here, or maybe it's as some others believe, that while people might know something, 
They're not coming forward out of fear of who may have actually caused Tony's disappearance. When you break this case down, there's really only a few different possibilities. I know that investigators have presented it as though almost anything could have happened, and while that's true, it's not exactly honest. Sure, anything could have happened. Tony could have been abducted by a UFO, but is that a rational consideration? If you rule out the outliers, if you disconnect from the ridiculousness of some theories, you're left with the meat of something that vaguely resembles a crime. Tony was smart, driven, a hardworking guy who loved his family so much that he still lived at home. He was known around town as the kind of guy who would go out of his way to help even a stranger as he hated seeing people suffering or in a bad spot. Perhaps that makes it all the more tragic. That in Tony's absence, not one damn person has even a tenth of the human decency he possessed to call in an anonymous tip, send a letter, or submit information online. It seems that while Tony was a sincere and caring person, he didn't have a lot of friends who could say the same about themselves. People talk, information comes out. Oftentimes, people believe they know something more, but they choose not to share it. Whether it's because they don't want to get involved, they aren't sure it's legitimate, or they don't even really believe it themselves. This is said often, but it can't be said enough. It doesn't matter if what you have to say seems remarkably insignificant. Tell the family. Tell the investigators. You never really know how a seemingly small detail could change everything. The family and investigators agree on very little, but one thing they do align on is something I also believe. Someone in that area, someone who knew Tony, knows a whole hell of a lot more than they've ever come forward with. In the absence of that information, you're left to sort through an entire slew of rumors, theories, and possibilities. To keep things simple, we're going to focus in on those theories that seem most likely and have been most commonly brought up. The first place we'll begin is in an area that I didn't expound upon too much during the evidence section of this episode. The reason I didn't talk much about it is because investigators have never mentioned it, no solid evidence linking this particular person to Tony's disappearance has been presented, but if the information stated by the family is accurate, and I have no reason to doubt it, it is linked to one of the oldest motives in the book. Money. I mentioned that Tony had been in a relationship with a woman for eight years, a relationship that ended in December of 2000, approximately five weeks prior to Tony's disappearance. This woman, whose name has never been revealed publicly, worked for law enforcement in a neighboring state. According to the family, this person had a rather checkered past before becoming involved in law enforcement, and they were never all that thrilled to see Tony dating her. Regardless, he was an adult who made his own choices, and so they did their best to be polite, though they never fully squashed their reservations. During their interview with the Coffee and Cases podcast, the family brought this woman up and linked her to a large sum of money which has been missing since Tony's disappearance. As discussed throughout the episode, Tony was a hard worker who was very good at saving his money, something many of us, including myself, struggle with. Yet, over most of his life, he deposited almost every dime he made except those needed for bills and expenses. At one point, the family noted that Tony had received a large sum of money in a settlement following an accident. According to Sandra, Tony kept his money in the family safe for years, and the dollar amount was believed to be approximately $300,000. One day, before the breakup, Sandra stated that she saw Tony taking his money out of the safe, and when asked where he was going with it, he said he was bringing it to this girlfriend's house. When asked why, Tony simply stated that was between him and his girlfriend. We don't know what the money was for, but given the two had been together for nearly a decade, perhaps they were considering purchasing a home. Well, after the breakup, it seems logical to assume that Tony would have wanted to get his money back. According to the family, they have never seen a dime of that money in the aftermath. Curiously, the family noted that after Tony's disappearance, this woman completely changed her life. She bought a new home, left her work in law enforcement, and became a go-go dancer, which I'm not sure if that's actually what she was doing or if that's a polite euphemism for stripping, but either way, this does seem like a dramatic shift. According to Anthony Sr., 
After Tony's disappearance, this woman refused to cooperate with investigators and turned down a request to take a polygraph test. None of that means she's guilty of anything. I wouldn't take a lie detector test either. But not sitting down for an interview with the police is very suspect. It was also noted that this woman may have a sibling who works for the FBI, and so her refusal to cooperate may have been under his advice, but that's purely speculative. However, even if you hated your ex at the end of the relationship, this person was an important part of your life for eight years. It seems remarkably callous to show so little care as to even have a conversation with police about him. Maybe she's innocent and didn't think she had anything helpful to offer. Or maybe she knows more than she's admitted. Unfortunately, there's not a ton of solid information to pursue in regard to this woman. If there were something more, we might be able to dig in deeper. But considering the only place these comments are available is in that one interview, you've got to wonder why this has been kept so quiet. The family hasn't shied away from saying exactly what they believe and the extents they've gone to to prove it. But this topic didn't come up in any of their newspaper articles or interviews. I can't help but wonder if that's because they were asked not to discuss it by law enforcement. Remember, Captain Paul Lacombe did say there were several scenarios considered. He just couldn't share what exactly they were, citing that it was an open investigation. If indeed this is an avenue that was explored, I'm not sure how it could be completely ruled out without some evidence to base that on. So, is it possible that this woman reached out to Tony and maybe even set him up? Certainly, but there doesn't appear to be any solid proof. It's suspicious as hell, I'll grant you that, but I think there would have had to have been more to warrant digging in further. Of course, it's entirely possible that the family did provide investigators with more than they've shared, and if so... I can't begin to imagine why this woman wasn't more thoroughly investigated. One theory revolving around the ex-girlfriend is that she may have arranged to meet Tony, allegedly to give him back his money, only for him to arrive at a location where he found someone else waiting for him. Or maybe it's like investigators theorized. Tony locked his car and climbed into a vehicle driven by someone he did think he could trust, or at least... He's someone he didn't think would ever harm him, and then everything went sideways. People have been killed for a hell of a lot less than $300,000. When a number's that high, you've got to be suspicious of anyone who knew about it or had access to it. Outside of the ex-girlfriend, the family believes there could be a connection to the Duchess Diner. Reportedly, one of the managers didn't seem to like Tony and treated him poorly when he was working. We don't have a ton of information about this, but it seems odd that Tony got along with everyone, but not this person. What becomes even more interesting is that the family claims people at the diner had previously asked Tony for loans, perhaps knowing that he saved his money. Whether or not any loans were ever given wasn't specified, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that issues between Tony and any of his co-workers could have revolved around his refusal to grant a loan, or maybe his request to have one paid back. Again, in this case, we find ourselves coming around to money. While the ex-girlfriend theory is fascinating, the diner seems to have a stronger link. We know the page that Tony received the night he vanished came from someone at that diner. We know that person called the next day, before Tony was reported missing, to ask if he picked up the Super Bowl tickets. Now, anyone who knew Tony was aware that he didn't care about football and had no interest in Super Bowl tickets. So the question becomes, was this call made by someone involved in the disappearance who wanted to check and make sure that Tony didn't make it home? Perhaps the person who paged him told him somewhere to meet, but didn't go themselves and wanted to see if the plan had been pulled off. At the same time, you have to wonder about the question of the Super Bowl tickets themselves. Not only do they come up in this call, but police would later theorize that perhaps Tony had left town in order to go to the Super Bowl. Where all this came from, no one seems to know for sure, but I can't help wondering if maybe Super Bowl tickets has a different meaning than what it seems to on the face. Perhaps this was a code word, a reference to something Tony might have known about, or maybe it was all just a ruse to try and get information from the family. Now, investigators stated they interviewed everyone from the diner and found nothing linking any of them to Tony's disappearance. At the same time, 
The rumor mill has been spinning a story for years that this may not be the entire story. Reportedly, someone in that diner was a member of a family who are well known in the local community. We're not talking about someone who has an excessive amount of power and authority, at least not enough to have a major crime swept under the rug, but it has been suggested this family name by itself may have enough pull to get people to keep their mouths shut, regardless of what they may or may not know. It would hardly be the first time something like this has happened in a smaller community. So, did the police really dig into this, or did they find themselves hitting an endless line of people who had no interest in participating in the investigation if it meant they might have to testify against someone whose family they feared? Sadly, we have no way of knowing. For the family, they believe that could be part of the sighting of Tony at the pool hall that night, the one which was later recanted. Reportedly, a bartender at Shark's initially told police he did remember seeing Tony the night he vanished, but he later changed his statement saying he must have been mistaken. While some have argued it's entirely possible this person mixed up their dates, others, including the family, believe it's more likely that when this person realized the scope of what had happened, they no longer wished to be a witness to anything. Again, like with so much of this case, it's entirely possible, but there's nothing yet found that can confirm it. Outside of these two primary theories, you get the same kind of information you get in a lot of cases. Maybe this was a situation where Tony was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe he went to the pool hall and found himself in over his head with someone looking to harm him. Maybe he drove up to Spratt Park to drop someone off or pick someone up or meet with someone and things went sideways there. Again, we have no way of knowing. While police have said the car looked as though Tony had gotten out, locked it, and then gotten into someone else's car, a possibility for sure. I find it conspicuous by its absence that they never commented on the possibility that Tony wasn't the person who parked the car there at all. If you're going to theorize he got in someone else's car without any solid evidence, why not theorize that someone else parked the car there? There's only two reasons I can come up with. You've been given information which leads you to believe the former rather than the latter or you simply didn't check every possibility. Even in good investigations, key clues can be missed, and this was far from what I would consider a good investigation. So sure, Tony could have somehow found himself the victim of a random act of violence. Maybe it was a mugging gone wrong, maybe it was something else, it's hard to say. But it does seem odd to leave the car there with his wallet and cash inside. According to his mother, This wasn't uncommon for him, and maybe it's in part because he was looking to avoid being robbed or having anything of value on him that could make him a target, but was he really concerned someone was going to steal $21 from him? I can't speak for Tony. Nobody can. But if I'm going to park my car and get into a car with someone I trust, I'm not going to feel compelled to leave my wallet locked in my car. It's coming with me. Unless I have a reason not. To trust this person. That's pure speculation on my part, but I think it follows a certain logic, something which is seemingly absent from much of this investigation. 22 years later, and that's where the case still stands. For more than two decades, Tony's fate has been left somewhere in the unknown. Did he choose to run off somewhere and start a new life with no car, no money, and no contact with a family to whom he was exceedingly close? You can't completely rule it out, but it sure seems unlikely. Was he targeted by someone for some reason, perhaps even someone he believed he could trust, and that night the page he received was purely designed to get him out of the house where he could be trapped and attacked? Seems much more likely than the previous concept, but again, hard to prove when you have no evidence. Sadly, this is how things remain. A desperate search for a missing man who, by all accounts, seems to have simply vanished from the face of the earth. We all know that doesn't happen. So what did happen that Wednesday night in January of 2001? It's a question his family has struggled with all these years, one that haunts them, and one for which the answer can produce a reward of $100,000 that remains unclaimed. The unfortunate truth seems to be that unless someone comes forward, new information is uncovered, or Tony himself is located, 
this case will remain open, unsolved, and extremely cold. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Anthony Ursioli Jr., there's not much of it out there. The Poughkeepsie Journal were the primary source for the vast majority of this episode, as well as the fantastic work released by the Coffee and Cases podcast, which I highly recommend you check out. If you have any information about the vanishing of Anthony Ursioli Jr., please contact the Town of Poughkeepsie Police Department at 845-485-3666. His case number is 2001-101887. You can also contact New York State Crime Stoppers at 1-866-313-8477, where you can submit any information anonymously. You can also send them information via the mail to the address 297 Knollwood Road, Suite 300, White Plains, New York, 10607. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine. Andrew Guarino, Ann Bertram, Camelia Tyler, Christine Greco, Danny Renee, Deirthy, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eloan Meyer, Fabulous TT, Guillerme Pinto, Jennifer Winkler, Julie A. Mangano, Justin Snyder, Kara Moreland, KY, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Madison Lahoulier, Marla Wright, Melissa Brekhuizen, Nick Mohar Shures, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tiffany Nelson, and Tom Radford. Without your amazing support, this show would not be possible. So thank you all so much for contributing to Trace Evidence. One quick reminder, if you're planning on attending CrimeCon this year in Orlando, Florida, use promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com to save 10% off your pass. Once again, that's promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit Trace-Evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. This concludes our coverage of the mysterious vanishing of Anthony Ursioli Jr., a highly solvable case if only someone would come forward with what they know. I want to thank you again for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.